I'm self-isolating, so I haven't had to get out of pyjamas in three days. Does it make you uncomfortable? Fine, I'll put some clothes on. Welcome to Sorry What, a show where I distill all the baffling information swirling around us in an attempt to help you find an answer for any time you've looked at the news and thought, Sorry what? This time I'm looking at the Democratic primary, a process by which the Democratic Party choose their nominee for President of the United States in 2020. Since we're doing American news this time, I thought it might be fun to jazz things up a little bit, try out some of those slick American news graphics, so let's get to it. At this point, the Democratic primary has reached a key milestone. We're down to two candidates and one robot, and we're getting a clear picture of how the Democratic base electorate is thinking and how they're voting. But I think it's important that we set the scene, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm really sorry. Can you make it go away? It's like I'm having an aneurysm. Oh, better, thank you. So how do we get here in the first place? There are two main parties in the American political system, the Democrats and the Republicans, also known as the Grand Old Party or the GOP, which is how I'll be referring to them since I generally struggle to say the word Republican, because I talk too fast and my lips don't open very much, not because they're heinous. Although, oh yes, yeah, stated by us at the beginning, I'm not an American, but if I were, I'd be a Democrat. And before you comment being like, oh, why do you even care? You're not from here. Well, we sent our country up to Swanee and what happens in the rest of the world now has a great impact on our future. Also, bitch, you can't sit there and be all, America the beautiful, exceptionalism, most powerful relation in the world, opulent, you earn everything. And then when someone shows interest and disagrees with you, be all, why do you even care? You can't have it both ways, America. I promise I won't do the accent again. <clears throat> much. Each party holds a primary in which politicians, celebrities, celebrity politicians, and rich white guys on an ego trip can put themselves forward to be selected. That sounds simple enough, but as we'll discover, America! The US has a presidential election every four years. Per the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution, no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice, so the current president is eligible to seek a second term. That means the GOP are running a primary, but you know. President Trump has won. He's won 10 states. Absolutely. And, you know, as, as you know, they he cleared the field. In some states, there are no Republican primaries. But if you're thinking, hey, you know, I could probably withhold my vote because Trump is so incompetent and he doesn't even hold Republican values. I just want to bring to your attention something I saw on the news a little while ago that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. 54 percent say that their allegiance is more with Donald Trump than with the Republican Party. Four more years. Meanwhile, at the start of 2019, the Democrats were having a bit of a crisis. Following Hillary Clinton's <clears throat> defeat, although how can you really lose when you win three million more votes and more votes than any person in the history of the presidency not named Barack Obama and calm, Dan, Zen, save it for November. There was a fear that the party was now directionless, that there was a lack of clear vision, that there was no leadership, no one candidate the entire party could rally around, and that courting general election voters, the vast majority of whom have no party allegiance whatsoever, was going to be an uphill struggle. Well, be careful what you wish for, Democrats, because when it rains, it pours. A veritable clown car of folks threw their hat into the race. There were the big hitters, the name candidates, the intriguing young upstarts, the governors, the senators, and Marianne Williamson. Girlfriend, you were so on. The field got so large that the first two televised debates, which are meant to allow voters to directly compare candidates side by side, had to be split over two consecutive nights. I'll be honest, it was kind of exasperating because while I believe strongly that you should never count anyone out, everyone deserves a fair crack of the whip, and that the very core of democracy is choice, to what end, Mr. Hickenlooper? The only eligibility requirements for president are that you are 35 years old, a natural born citizen, and that you've lived in the US for 14 consecutive years. So theoretically, anyone can run for president. But just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. Girlfriend, you were so on. Fortunately, some of the candidates started to trickle away, but then some more got in. Not surprising, Democrats have always had a problem with people breaking in. <laughs> not my best. But by February, the field that had seen a total of 29 contenders had winnowed to eight. So everything turned out all white. Right, all right. As voters' Pokemon went to the polls and paths to the nomination started to get dicier, more candidates dropped out until the most diverse field of candidates in history came down to... Me two old white guys on the ticket. And a robot. One thing you'll hear me bang on about over the course of this video is the importance of unity. If Democrats stand a chance of winning in November, it's important they coalesce. So in that spirit, I'm not here to rip them to shreds, all right? They were all fine candidates and we have to get behind whoever wins the contest, okay? We vote blue no matter who. I'm here to drag the process, not the candidates, okay, if you insist. Girlfriend, you were so on. Bernie Sanders, you have the energy of a man who is permanently trying to hold onto his umbrella in a storm. I bet your idea of a Christmas present is a pack of document wallets wrapped in brown paper. Mayor Pete, you look so cute in your dad's suit. I bet you were the kid who brought a stapler to school in his pencil case. And sure, maybe that kid should be president, but go fuck yourself. Mike Bloomberg. 
You have done racist things and I don't like it. Tom Steyer, how does it feel to have made a billion dollars but to have made no impact on the world? Amy Klobuchar, you are no bullshit. Anyone who eats a salad with a comb is someone I don't want to fuck with. I bet the streets of Minnesota are littered with sat navs that have told you to turn right just a little bit too late. Joe Biden, I feel for you. You know, it can't be easy knowing that you're going to win the nomination just because people miss your cooler, more attractive friend. Elizabeth Warren. You should have been president and I miss you, you fucking nerd. Oh, okay, that felt good. Okay, now that we've done that, let's get on to the process. And if you thought those were jokes, wait until I tell you about caucuses. The Democratic primary is contested at state level, with contests happening in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., five U.S. territories, and a group of U.S. citizens living overseas known as Democrats Abroad. In the summer of an election year, the parties hold their national convention, at which they officially nominate their candidate for president. Each state sends a number of representatives, or delegates, to the convention relative to that state's size, whose job it is to cast a vote on that nomination. How those delegates vote is decided in those state-level contests, and there are two types, a caucus and a primary. A primary contest is pretty straightforward. You go to a polling station, line up, select your preferred candidate, and then go about your day. Once the polls are closed, the votes get counted. A caucus is... well... mental. And I know I'm a Brit, so technically I don't understand exactly what reporters mean when they like to claim that it's American democracy in action. But it's mental. Explaining it with words will just exhaust you, and I have no animation skills. But visual learning is useful, so I thought I'd improvise. On the night of a caucus, voters rock up to the venue and literally go and stand in a corner of the room assigned to their preferred candidate. If they're undecided, they can just sort of mill about in the middle like kids at a school disco. Once everyone's in place, they're counted up. In order to pass through to the next phase, a candidate must be considered viable, which means they must have the support of at least 15% of people in the room. That 15% is a key stat you'll hear again in a bit. If your candidate is viable, huzzah, stay put. If your candidate has failed to make the threshold, alas, alack, they can't progress, but you still have a vote. So go and stand in the middle with the rest of the kids who have no date. And now here's where things get interesting. For a period of time, supporters of the viable candidates can come over to the undecided group and try and persuade them to pledge support to their candidate. When it's time to count again, everyone goes back to their candidate at section bringing with them any new recruits, and this process continues until only viable candidates remain. It all sounds quite fun, actually, and the principle of neighbours getting together to talk about why they support a particular candidate and try to come to a general consensus is a good one, but the practicalities of it can be really quite prohibitive to the electorate. Firstly, you have to show up to the caucus location by the time the door closes in the evening and the process begins. If you don't get there on time, you don't get a vote. So if you can't arrange childcare or if you work late, if you have health issues, if you're elderly, you kind of don't have a voice. Secondly, the hours can be long. The process takes a while, so usually it's only the most firmly committed activists who end up having their say. And if one candidate has a particularly vocal and impassioned group of supporters, well, they're more likely to do well. And don't get me started on the way they literally flip a coin to decide some votes that are a bit too close. And also, Iowa, in February, it's bloody cold. In the Nevada caucus, if the contest is too close, you pick a card and the high card wins. That is camp. Either way, once the process is complete, the state can start pledging delegates to candidates, and this is done in accordance with the share of the vote that the candidate gets. Remember the 15% of the vote that you had to get to be considered viable? That's the threshold you need to pass to be assigned any delegates at all. Which is a very clear and straightforward set of rules. What could possibly go wrong? There was extra drama this year when the decision to use an app to report the votes went... badly. Dreadfully. Catastrophically. The app didn't work, people tried to do it on paper instead, they tried to call in results, but that wasn't allowed. It was basically a dumpster fire, and it led to a severe delay in the reporting of results, which, for the campaigns, meant chaos. You see, it's around this time that we start to see candidates dropping out of the race. A poor showing in Iowa gives voters in upcoming states less confidence, so they're likely to divert their attention elsewhere. A strong showing, even a surprise third place, can allow a candidate to suggest they're serving underdog realness. I think we know enough to say with some certainty that New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. The delay in Iowa basically allowed every campaign to claim they won, and it added further noise to the discourse about whether or not the process is beginning in the right place. <laughs> Iowa are the first state in the nation to hold their contest because they decided to be. I literally can't find any other reason. New Hampshire, which comes next, actually has it written into their state law that they'll be the first in the nation to hold a primary, which 
Again, makes no sense. These two states are deeply unrepresentative of the Democratic electorate, but also the US as a whole. Both states are approximately 90% white, while the rest of the country is 60% white. And between them, they make up just 1.4% of the population. In itself, this isn't necessarily a problem, but the results in these two states can be make or break for certain candidates. Which is not to say that the citizens of these states don't take their first in the nation responsibility seriously. Quite the opposite, they take it very seriously indeed. But when viable good candidates like these are forced to drop out before the first vote is even cast, you kind of have to ask the question, could we be more representative? Could we be more representative? I didn't mean to be Chandler, but there you go. Some things are inbuilt. Meanwhile, after Joe Biden came fourth in Iowa and didn't hit the 15% threshold in New Hampshire, the media declared his campaign pretty much done for. He went on to squeak into second in Nevada and then came South Carolina. CNN projects that Joe Biden is the winner in South Carolina. Since then, he's gone on to win 15 of the 22 contests and become pretty much the presumptive nominee in all but name. Sidebar, I'm filming this on the 17th. There are gonna be four more states voting tonight. So well, here are the results of those now. Lol if they undermine everything I'm trying to say. There are tons of reasons for his resurgence and success and I'm not gonna fully go into them because I don't wanna turn this into a data analysis video. I'm not very good at that. And if you want to, excellent work is done by people like 538, link in the description. Go and have a look if you wanna get nerdy. Want to catch me riding nerdy? Wow. However, I do want to highlight as a point of contrast, Elizabeth Warren came ahead of Biden in both Iowa and New Hampshire and had great showings in several debates, raising a ton of money, but didn't see the same bounce on Super Tuesday when a whole ton of states vote at the same time. A part of that is to do with campaign organizing and outreach, and a part of that is to do with media coverage. But in a season where the word electability is on everyone's lips, a part of the discussion has to go to the fact that certain candidates face an uphill struggle straight out of the gate. The word electability is incredibly loaded, and while not everybody means it in that loaded sense, because people are genuinely concerned about whether or not a candidate can defeat Donald Trump in November, there is a subtext to it, intended or otherwise, much like how some candidates, naming no names, have been criticized over their likability. What can you say to the voters of New Hampshire on this stage tonight, who see your resume and like it, but are hesitating on the likability issue, where they seem to like Barack Obama more? Well, that hurts my feelings. <laughs> I'm sorry, Senator. He's very likable. I, I, I agree with that. I don't think I'm that bad. Um, uh, you're likable no. enough. Thank Hillary, you so much. No <laughs> I think the frustration that many women and people of color feel about this is incredibly valid. I mean, sure, we should be voting purely on policy and who is best for the job and not take identity into account but we don't live in that utopia yet. Unfortunately, there is an element of intersectional prejudice going on here, and to dismiss people as reductive when they bring that frustration up is not helpful. Vogue put it best, and I think pretty starkly, actually. It's a cruel and frankly outrageous bill of goods that women and girls are sold to be bombarded by bedazzled who run the world t-shirts and girl power buttons, only to be told by the general electorate over and over again that the best you can hope for is vice president, maybe, or first lady. It's perhaps equally damaging and only fuels the cyclical white maleness of the presidency that men and boys have never seen a woman in the Oval Office. And the numbers are bearing this out. Let's look at Michigan. In 2016, Hillary Clinton lost the state by 11,000 votes. She lost support among white male voters to Donald Trump by a 12 point margin. And in the primary, she lost them to Sanders by 15 points. According to patterns in the 2020 primary, those voters appear to be gravitating to Biden, which could be good news in the general election. And the circumstances are different. The end of eight years of Obama were a lot more comfy for voters than the four years of Trump. And here's something that really interests me. Hillary Clinton running for political office is thought about in a wildly different way than Hillary Clinton doing a job. So while we can't directly compare, we can pop a little flag next to 20 2016 and wonder. And Obama had to walk his own tightrope, playing a perfectly balanced game on the way to proving that America could vote for a black president. And interestingly, his pitch in the speech at the Democratic National Convention in 2004, the one that launched him into public consciousness, was almost one of color blindness. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. In his astonishing essay, My President Was Black, ta Coates writes about the complexity of Obama's successes, failures, 
and his legacy in a way that I literally could never given my experience of the world as a white man. I'd encourage you to read the full essay and in fact read the whole book that it comes in. It's called We Were Eight Years in Power, but I kind of need you to stick around to the end of the video, you know, for that algorithm. And once you've gone and, and read his work, you aren't going to want to come back because you'll realize I'm quite rubbish and ineloquent. So um, I'll just link it in the description and quote this bit here instead. If the president's inability to cement his legacy in the form of Hillary Clinton proved the limits of his optimism, it also revealed the exceptional nature of his presidential victories. For eight years, Barack Obama walked on ice and never fell. The fact that no person of colour has had the same shot at the office since, and the fact that the man who succeeded Obama was the leader of the movement that tried to deny his very legitimacy as an American, shows that that dream of a post-racial America that was born on a cold November night in 2008 is yet to be true. With the outbreak of coronavirus, this election is turning into a fear election. What might the next four years look like after the vote in November? Voters are behaving like pundits and worrying about that old electability chestnut and saying things like, hey, you know, I like her, but I just don't know if my neighbour will vote for a woman. They're nervous. And when voters are nervous, they tend to go for the safe option. And as Cornell Belcher said on MSNBC, the safe option, regardless of qualifications, doesn't tend to look like him. It tends to look like, well, this. In closing, and to be abundantly clear, both of the candidates left in the race have the potential to make good presidents. Not that the bar is especially high right now, but they'll only have the opportunity to try if at the end of the primary, there is unity. The point of a primary is finding consensus. It doesn't mean we won, suck it, you lost. It means we won, but we need to listen to the voices of those who supported the other guy and find a way to bring our movements together and move forward, bringing the rest of the country along with us. In 2016, after losing the primary, Bernie Sanders actually helped to write the platform upon which Hillary Clinton ran for president. And if he gets the nomination, Joe Biden will run for president on the most progressive platform a Democrat has ever run on. For some, it might not be progressive enough, and that's a conversation that needs to be had. But let's take climate change. It's an emergency in which strong action needs to be taken as quickly as possible to try and stem the crisis. Joe Biden has a plan. You might not think it goes far enough, and that's perfectly valid. But think about this. If Biden wins the nomination and doesn't budge from where he is now, the choice in November will be between a man who wants to pledge $1.7 trillion to tackling the climate crisis and a guy who denies it even exists. The stakes are incredibly high, and I believe that both Sanders and Biden know that. I hope that they can convince the rest of America. Good luck. We're all rooting for you. Oh God. Please subscribe.